I think this guy, Stugatz, is better as a broadcaster than he was as a basketball player, and he was pretty good as a basketball player. I think that he thinks he's a better basketball player than he is a host or a media well, member. This so is what I would say. Like you're insulting I, okay. his game. All right. Well, I will ask him in a second because I think he would say it's a hell of a lot harder to get to the top of that profession <laughs> than it is to get like, to the top of this one. Like he's surrounded by baboons. Like it's un- this guy can out argue people hey. on television because he knows more about what he's talking about than most of the people he's talking to. But I speak a first take. And I speak uh, elsewhere as well, J.J., because you're teaching people some things, it seems. It seems like you've become very popular. Thank you for joining us, at least in part because people connect with the way that you explain basketball and your expertise is obvious. And you must be frustrated. It's co- it seems like it's covered very poorly in the loudest places, even though it's covered very well in you know some of the places that are occupied by people who cover the sports well like you you understand where we are in media coverage with you've come to this game and you're looking to change it it seems like well I I I don't know if it's possible to completely change it Dan Um, and in terms of my basketball career I always understood who I was as a player Uh, so I have no sort of ego attached to that my my reasoning behind the last 30 years of my life is it comes from a very simple place of love, uh, just a, a deep seated love and obsession with the game of basketball. And when I got into the media space, you know, I had done the podcast uh, since 2016. We started the old man in the three in 2020 from the bubble. I didn't really understand the landscape of sports media. I didn't pay attention to it as a player. I dealt with beat writers. I knew a few national reporters, but I wasn't watching First Take or any of the other debate shows. I, Other than some viral clips of Chuck and Kenny and Shaq, I didn't really watch uh, with a critical lens pregame and halftime shows. I didn't even really watch broadcast through a critical lens. And now uh, that I'm part of media, I, I think it's just it goes back to just a natural sort of obsession and preparedness that I'm analyzing sort of everything. I'm analyzing how uh, people come out of commercial. I'm analyzing how people do a highlight. Uh, and I'm always just I'm always trying to prepare as best I can for any hit I do, whether that's first take or, uh, you know, the stuff we do with DraftKings or Old Man of the Three or calling a game. Um, it doesn't all blend together. But it, my approach is sort of the same in all of it. Um, I mean, the long-term plan would be to sure to change the way sports are covered, but I don't think we're we're going to win that race. Oh, but I'm more curious, right, whether or not the mastery of this thing, because you've clearly, whatever, we can analyze it however you want, but you're very good at this, and you've got a safe space where you've got a popular podcast where people learn from you. But also it seems like people now want you to go to the front of the line and coach some of these basketball teams, become, <laughs> become a head coach, and I could see that being a competitive calling too, and I can also see that making you crazy because you're on the sideline watching and you can only help so much. Yeah, you know, I'll say this broadly about coaching. Um, When I retired and my uh, performance coach and therapist really helped me through that process, I don't know that I could have really done it alone. Letting go of of playing basketball was such a such a hard thing to do. And in the subsequent sort of sessions we had, we kind of figured out what are what are the things you really loved about the game? And obviously the competition and not just the competition, but competing at the highest level. Uh, There was the collaboration, the teamwork. uh, There was the performance anxiety. Uh, And then later on, as probably six to eight months into retirement, I I realized there was a leadership component that I really enjoyed, especially the second half of my career. And coaching checks all those boxes. And and so that's where my interest in coaching comes from. And it also goes back to my original point, Dan, is just that I love the game and I I view anything I do from here on out. I don't get to be a player anymore. I don't, I view anything I do from here on out as just being a steward of the game. I'm I'm coaching my eight-year-old. He's a second grader. I'm coaching a third grade team. He's playing up, but you know, even just doing that and teaching 14 kids, my view of how basketball should be played and my view of how you should be a teammate and how you should respect officials and and respect your te- your your coaches and and how you interact with your parents as they're giving you instruct like 
it all is part of it. It's all part of this beautiful game that I got to enjoy for so long. JJ, that painting behind you looks expensive as hell, but also like something a child <laughs> could do. You're right. Is that you an know, expensive painting, or did I don't your know child if it's do the that? lighting? How much did it cost? No, it's. Uh, I, I don't think it costs that much. We're, we're you know we have a studio and proper lighting and camera and monitors everywhere and a switchboard. Um, but we, you know, this is sort of the ode to the old man in the sea, the uh, Hemingway book that our podcast is named after. Yeah. yeah. Overrated book, though, a bit, right? <laughs> it's of not my course. favorite Hemingway book. Oh, it's oh, not my you, favorite JJ. Hemingway book. Yeah. Top five Hemingway books? <laughs> yeah. You go first. I'm thinking that he could do that, although I'd like to hear Strugatz's <laughs> list. I, I also feel like you said a lot of words there without totally answering clearly for me. Which one do you think is going to be a better job? What you're presently doing now? You can't do both, or coaching the Raptors or the Sixers or coaching, like, and being closer to basketball than you are right now. Oh, I could never do both. I mean, it's impossible. But um, I, I would say I view any decision through a very analytical lens, and I weigh everything, and I'm able to make decisions quickly. Um, I don't think going into coaching is a decision that I want to make quickly. Um, the piece about media right now, I work, I work, I mean, you, you guys know this cause you you're in it and you're doing it all, all the time. You work it it's like a, a, you work it like a basketball player. You're not going to be lazy it, about this. No, no, no. I work, I work my ass off. I mean, you got to be good at this. You have to work your ass you're off. You're right. So it's nonstop work. You're right. There is, there is, but, but I will say this, I get to work really hard and I, I love the work, but I also get the lifestyle that I want like coaching my kid four days a week. Uh, and I miss some for games and travel or tonight I have to miss practice because we have a, we have an event or whatever, but like there's a, I was in, I was in Tennessee this weekend at a, on a golf trip. Like I, I get to do those things, which are really nice. Uh, and then you have to weigh that against, wow. you what? know, what I think I, what I think I, I like, I view coaching as, as a calling. I really do. Not just, not just for me. I think people, that are really good coaches have innate skills. And I, and I hope that I had those skills that I think I have can translate at some point. And I don't know when or if that will happen, but if it does happen, I'm, I'm confident thank I can you. do it. Chris Cody. Thank you. Cause you just whispered to me, coaches are miserable and you are at an existential crossroads. And, and <laughs> honestly, if you're grieving the retired what? athlete that you were, and now you've got to make a choice, Hey, do I really want to be a basketball coach and insane and miserable because I'm trying to figure out 20 hours out of 24 in a day <laughs> if my timeout's going to spark J.J. Redick or not. Like, honestly, to care that that way, it almost forces you to neglect your family, does it not? Uh, that's that's the piece that's really hard to wrap your head around. Um, in some ways, and I, I, I even with therapy, I haven't been able to get over this, but I am a masochist, and that's probably – uh, part of the the interest in coaching is just uh, you know self abuse. That's I, I recognize that. <laughs> you love basketball. I love Christopher Mad Dog Russo. Uh, what's the take he's given you on first take that has infuriated you the most? Um, I love I love Chris. I love working with him. We're obviously from very different generations, and we come in into first take with very different perspectives. the the first The first take hit. I think it was the earliest one that that sort of went viral or whatever was the Bob Cousy take. And I'll tell you why that infuriated me the most. So it was one of the first, I mean, it might've even been the first, but it was one of the first two times that I worked with Chris on set. You basically, is, you basically said some version of Bob Cousy had a second job as a plumber. And I didn't say Bob Cousy did. No, 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 no. So that, so this is the, <laughs> the guys he played against. Yeah. I'll set it up. The take the the segment was supposed to be on Kyrie flipping the bird to the Boston crowd. And Earlier in the show, while I was in the green room, Chris was just railing on Chris Paul. And I said something in rebuke of Chris Paul. And uh, Stephen A said, Chris Paul's a top five point guard ever. And then Mad Dog says, <laughs> Bob Cousy's the greatest point guard ever. And then we went and do a whole thing. And of course, the quip at the end about plumbers and firemen, which is a fact that a lot of those players back in the 50s did have summer jobs. They were farmers and welders and whatnot. Um, I, Again, it's entertainment. I wasn't trying to be disrespectful. It was just kind of stating a fact in a funny way. Anyways, what made me mad after the fact about that was I was like, "Who? I got to know more about this guy. Again, I didn't pay attention to sports media. I didn't know who Mad Dog was. He's a legend. I get it. He's a legend. 
So I go on this YouTube deep dive where I'm like looking up all these clips of Mad Dog and I find a segment on first take where he names his top five point guards ever. And guess who's not on that list? Bob Cousy. Mm -hmm. He was just trolling me and I took the bait and that that's why I was angry. <laughs> I, I want to, Classic uh, doggy, if, I mean. if you can stay with us, I don't know what kind of hurry you're in. Uh, again, he hosts the Old Man in the Three podcast. I urge you to listen to it. It's very strong. He's doing analyst work for ESPN, and he's got a mastery over some of the things that he is uh, doing right now. And he might just go coach because he's an idiot. Because uh, and he likes suffering and self. No, a fool, a, uh, an educated fool. Because I would oh, not man. advise that for anybody. Uh, but we, I want to play some sound for him because in that take, didn't you have a whole bunch of legends? Like it, it was carnivorous. Didn't Dominique Wilkins and a whole bunch of people say, "Who the hell is JJ Redick?" Uh, well, no. Th th so basically, the Bob Cousy one, uh, which was last year. Uh, I got Bob Cousy, bless bless him. Uh, you know, he's an uh, older man now. He he got on a radio show in Boston and defended me. Uh, and then in in summer league, I'm literally golfing with Johnny West, Jerry's son. Uh, and two days later, Jerry West just eviscerates me, which Jerry West is one of my, you know, I wish I could have watched him play live because I, I love Jerry West. So that happened. And then earlier this season, Doggy said that uh, Steve Kerr is a, or a, I'm sorry, Larry Bird is a top five three point shooter ever. And I said, objectively, that's, you know, that's hard to sort of argue when, you know, he's 250th in percentage and even worse in all time makes, right? He wasn't a volume shooter, different era. I get it. I said, Larry Bird is the top 10 player of all time. Unequivocally, Larry Bird's one of the greatest shooters ever unequivocally, one of the best players of all time. Yet, I don't think you can make an argument that he's top five, three point shooter ever. And then a bunch of players like Dominique Wilkins and everybody just said I was disrespecting Larry Bird, which again, I, this is where I, Dan, you know this. Like this is where the aggregate media world and and social media just <laughs> makes everything about this job. Sh um, Sorry, <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to avoid aggregate media. You know, and we we even do it at first take. I'll you know I'll I'll jump on Twitter or whatever. And I'm scrolling my timeline. I follow first take, and there's a there's a quote that I have or that Stephen A has, and then there's the video clip, and maybe it's a two minute video clip of a 12 minute segment. And I feel like in today's media, we're always losing a little bit of context, which is why I really enjoy the podcast because it's, if you actually listen, it's hard to lose the context of everything. And even then I've experienced a million times, even then they take things out of a larger conversation and create a headline and, uh, you know, people just run with it. I love that we're rehashing takes right now, like we're doing an episode of Second Take. Yes, we are. In fact, we're going to continue with Second Take after this, otherwise named uh, Legend. Get on JJ. <laughs> I want to. I want to. I want to say, I wanna say this because I, I, I'm. I'm again. I'm. I. I mean this. I'm very self-critical, and after every single first take a podcast, I give some takes on podcasts too because I can go on these rants. I'm always like, do I stand by it? Whether I was right or wrong, I don't. Like sometimes, and I've admitted at times, I've, I've admitted when I'm wrong. I have no problem doing that. Do I stand by what I said? Was I being stupid by what I said? I don't go into any of these takes with like an agenda. Mm. And things happen. I get put in situations where I have to respond to something on live television. And I generally, I'm like, I I feel good about that. The one, the one that I really struggled with was last year, right after the All-Star break, CJ McCollum does a interview at all-star break and says he you know he played five games for the pelicans he'd been on the team for like two weeks and said i haven't talked to zion yet and i was pretty harsh on zion and i i regret that one that was one i regret and part of it was that was really that was where i crossed the threshold of being pro player versus being overly the top critical of a player and i struggle with that one i'm not gonna lie i struggle with that one now we're doing third take. Yes, we come back with third take after this. <laughs> I love My it. God I love Almighty. it.
Stugatz, you're being very gentle, okay? Mad Dog is a legend to you, an icon. Yes. My and, God Almighty! And, and, and this, this uh, JJ Come Lately is being disrespectful by bringing facts and analytics and expertise to the proceedings mm -hmm. and routinely making Mad Dog sound and look like a fool yeah. from, from a different time, from Bob Cousy's time. And it's disrespectful. He's just come to the media game and he thinks he's McAfee. Yeah, it is. Uh, Mad Dog's a legend. But you said that you kind of did some research. You realized that. I was very upset with you, Larry Bird. Take, in fact, I did an hour of radio right after that where I asked our listeners a question. A shot for your life, Reddick or Bird, who you choose it? So, JJ, I will ask you that same question, okay? You have a shot. Your life depends on it. And there's only two people that could shoot that shot for you. Yourself or Larry Bird? Who are you choosing? Huh? Huh? You were the guy that posited that question? Oh, now I got issues. Now I got issues. Because this is what happens every single time. I got to, no, 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 no. I got to say something. Okay, sorry. Every time this has happened, right. people want to compare my career to some. I never put myself in any category. I never said I was a great player. I never said I was one of the all-time greatest shooters. Why are you bringing me into it? I, but I, I'm talking about two different things, and I get drawn into it. I'm right. always taking myself. I'm not putting my, my life in someone else's hands. I'm always going to shoot that yeah. shot. Well, oh, you're dead. Yeah. oh, yeah. See, this is what Stugat <laughs> says every time. He's like, and J.J. Reddick, if you choose J.J. Reddick, you're dead. You're, this does not assume that both you and Larry will make the shot. It's that he will make it, and you will miss it. Although, by percentage, you are the much smarter choice, but I'm still taking Larry. <laughs> this is the I other mean. thing. I think you should just say it, Reddick. Across eras, I'm a more accurate, precise <laughs> shooter than Larry Bird. I would make careful, more, JJ. I, I, he he would. I, he's better. I'll leave. I'll leave. I'll leave. The, I'll leave this little tidbit with with you guys. Four players in NBA history have made over 1,800 threes and shot over 41 percent from three. I'm one of them. So take that with. <laughs> That's take basketball. That with. Yeah, but for your life, you gotta bring. You gotta bring facts to it, baby. You gotta bring facts to it. <laughs> no facts. Shot for your life, though. I mean, JJ, you're a great shooter. I'm choosing Larry. I mean. Okay. I have no problem with that. Okay. Uh, but I don't blame JJ. I hope this gets aggregated. I wish I was wearing a costume <laughs> of some sort. Reddick says he's better than Bird. Uh, because, yes, exactly. because, because I do want I do want all these old timers and Oakley and everyone else to say their time is the best time and that you're that you're J.J. Reddick. Who the hell's J.J. Reddick? Well, somebody right. who was super precise yeah. from three in a sport that it's, I mean, you're kind of at the forefront of changing the way the entire sport has been played because we've got to guard guys like you out there. Well, I, I, I probably missed it by five years. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't okay to be a high-volume three-point shooter till Steph, Dame, and Harden started doing it. And yeah, I was at the early stages when the Magic were shooting a bunch of threes. Relative to the NBA, they'd probably be last now in three-point attempts per game, uh, those 9 10 teams. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I look, I'm grateful for my career, and I'm grateful for the era that I was in. Basketball is only going to get better. That's The players now are coming in more skilled. Uh, we got to figure out a way culturally to sort of you know, get buy in to the hard stuff, which is one of the reasons the fucking Miami Heat are in the in one game away from the NBA finals, because they have a bunch of guys who buy into the hard stuff. This is crazy, and I don't think I've ever seen anything like it in uh, basketball. Eight seeds just simply don't do what the Heat are doing. And I hear a lot of people saying the Celtics are coached terribly. And I also hear a lot of people saying that last night specifically they quit when getting 21 offensive rebounds to Miami's one offensive rebound. Are they broken? Did they quit? Uh, no, I don't think they quit. I, I just was on, I just recorded a, an episode of the podcast uh, about an hour ago. I talked about connectivity, connectivity. And as a, as a player, you feel it as a viewer, you can see it. And I don't feel like there's been great connectivity with Boston for a long stretch of the season. They were so good early in the season, halfway through the season, whatever. I haven't felt that connectivity. And it's not just like between a coach and a player. It's player to player. You see that in defensive rotations. You see that in shot selection. The Jalen Brown three, 
right? It's 56-35 in the second quarter. Jimmy's playing off him. Jalen's got the ball at 29 feet. Tatum comes off the screen. He looks him off and jacks the three. Like, it's just connectivity. That's what I think is – I don't think they quit. I think they want to win. But there's a there's a connectivity that's just not there right now. The Heat have it. The Nuggets have it in spades. The Lakers have had that uh, since they made the trades. And I just haven't felt that, haven't seen that from Boston. JJ, uh, Charlotte Wilder, Celtics fan here. Any chance we can get oh, you? Oh, hey, to- Charlotte. Hey, we're also What's up? we're also neighbors. Um, yeah, is there any them. way? I know you have a great media career. You're journalism. Golfing. Yeah, journalism. <laughs> uh, but can you like hop in game four and maybe like hit a few threes? Is that possible? I, I would need a day, just to get ready so maybe i should go start shooting now but i could i could hit one four day five threes larry I bird would four or five threes yeah. wow I go with four or five threes right now <laughs> larry bird wouldn't need uh wouldn't need that time thank you for being on with us jj stugatz thinks he would hit a three in an in an nba game that's a thing that he thinks i don't think so <laughs> i don't think so on the warriors though what do you think like they're moving the ball so. around rotation i'm sitting there i'm spotting up for a wide open three i could drain one I don't I, I don't think you realize the difference in time. And this is not an offense, but but you're not getting a shot off in an NBA game. <laughs> JJ Reddit, shot for your life. Stu Gotts or Larry Bird right now. Yeah. Oh man. Oh I, by the way, I should say this. I'd be totally comfortable with Larry taking a shot for my life. But if given the choice between Larry and myself, right. I'm gonna trust myself. That's you're all. Dead. I trust myself more than anyone else. Right. How about Larry or Steph though? For your life. For your life. Life. I'm hoping. Hopefully, I'm never in that situation. But you, you guys know I'm going to say stuff. Right. <laughs> My God Almighty! <laughs> See you later, JJ. Thank you. My All God. right, guys. See you. Love you, JJ. Uh, All right. What Thanks, is guys. that? Thank okay, you, JJ. I, I. That's one of my new favorite never things. Never got to Hemingway. One of my. I gave Stu a top five Hemingways. Let's just... do it. Yeah, let's do let's it. do it right now. All right. Uh, it's, I, it would have been funnier though if you would just done it. Number five, Stu Gotts. Old man in the sea. Da. Number four. The sun also rises. Number three. Men without women. The Levitard show on a Tuesday. Number two. A farewell to arms. <laughs> Number one. For whom the bell rolls. I'm supposed to say tolls. Tolls. That is uh. <laughs> Typo by Smetty. <laughs> For whom the bell rolls and Stu goes with it. I was going to say not Chris Cody because he couldn't find the fan fan. Charlotte, congratulations on being the latest journalist to embarrass me. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, what you, you, also, you're welcome. What are you doing? <laughs> what, are you come in, Celtics fan. You can't be proud Celtics fan today. You got to be a shamed Celtics fan today. I th- yep. I'm a laughing Celtics fan today. If that If last night wasn't funny to you even as a Celtics fan like that was one of the funniest games I've ever seen they put in Luke Cornett and they're like oh maybe he'll fix it can we talk for a second about the Zeller minutes because I really do think ah the Zeller minutes he should be playing with one of those retainers that has the wire on the front outside of like it's it's funny you can't help but laugh at the Zeller minutes and you see it on Jimmy's face too Jimmy's always just like oh god this guy again Gave uh, you some good ones last night. Yeah, that, I, Dan. I, I'm terrified of whatever that is. Not when Jokic is on the court, please. I also, Joe Mazzulla, I just have one one real quick Celtics thing. Yeah. Joe Mazzulla, Brian Scalabrini said that Joe Mazzulla said that he watches a town four times a week. Uh, not to shamelessly plug my newsletter, but the wilderthings.substack.com. I rewatched the town, yeah. wow. and it's two hours and four minutes long. It, it would to watch that four days a week. It would take, I mean, four yeah, four times a week. It would take an entire work day of just <laughs> watching the town. Um, but also, I think he needs a new movie. Ooh, yeah. And I think what Joe Mazzulla needs to watch four times this week is Manchester by the Sea, <laughs> <laughs> the saddest Boston movie of all time. The Celtics are the house. He's burning it down. Spoiler alert. Um, that's that's my take. How about watching some film? Here. I mean. Well, yeah, but that's not as fun. 
That is one thing that you could do. Yes, the watching of film is what people assume he is not doing. The town was a shameless move by him to simply ingratiate himself to Boston, which, I mean, Stugatz, when you look at the difference between those two basketball teams, let's play that Jimmy sound as if Jimmy is going to be, is it sounded ridiculous all year when Jimmy was saying we're going to be in the same place. But he told you last year at this time, because I do want to get to, you have others, or is it just, is it just Manchester by the sea? Are there others? Well, he should be watching something else, uh, The Departed, because soon that's what he'll be. <laughs> wow. Let's play that Jimmy Butler wow. sound from last year, Chris Cody. Like I said, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to play with the guys that I did have the opportunity to play with. And it's been like that every year that I've played in the league. Uh, so we had enough. Um, next year, we will have enough. And we're going to be right back in the same situation. And uh, we're going to get it done. Gooseys. <laughs> I mean, it's like the secret you just think something and you say it out loud and you will it into existence and the Celtics fall asleep or, or fall apart while you're watching Stugatz three of the, the last four years these have been the two best teams in the conference and you got to suffer and you got to break before you get to the to the the graduation that is taking the title and the idea that Jimmy Butler would come back at this age when all of us were doubting when he got here you can't you can, maybe you can win with Tatum as your best player. You cannot win with Jimmy Butler as your best player. All of us were doing some form of that. For Jimmy Butler to break that franchise over his knee? That's the biggest surprise. It's not, well, him breaking them over his knee, but people expected the Celtics to be one of the two teams in the Eastern Conference. Maybe the Sixers were that other team. No one expected it to be a team led by Jimmy Butler. I cannot believe what we're witnessing I don't think we've ever seen it before in NBA no, history. No, we haven't. That sport, right. th that sport doesn't do random. Baseball, football, hockey all do random. This has no precedent. Doing it easy is the part. You've got a couple of eights that have done something. But more interesting to me is... But, Dan, you've never had a player go from where Jimmy was to being the guy in the league. That is crazy when you think about it. He is the guy you want with the ball in the fourth quarter, late in games, over just about everyone else in the NBA. Stugatz Crazy. is right. There's an argument to be made that Jimmy's the most singularly dominant playoff player in the NBA over the last four years. Four years of heat. Go sit in the penalty box. <laughs> also, Tyler Zeller, come on home, you ball-headed. Yeah.